in our review of history, we're going to look at a message that follows the third angel's message. The pioneers called this the loud cry message because when the Bible presents it, it says that the angel spoke with a loud voice. So they commonly refer to it as the loud cry. This is found in Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, but we're just going to look at verse 1. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was, was lightened with his glory. There's a message that comes to help the three angels' messages. The message of Revelation 18 comes to give power to the third angel's message. It illuminates the whole world. And we need to know what that message is. And our history doesn't fail to tell us what it is through the spirit of prophecy. So let's take a look. Let's look at the historical context. As we began to grow as a movement, we let Christ, His coming, and His righteousness be secondary in our minds. It wasn't the focus anymore, but it was something secondary. It seemed like it was dying off from the focus. And we were getting accustomed to this world. Like the children of Judah, um, we forgot the way of the Lord. Look what it says in, um, in 2 Chronicles 12, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. So just like them, we forsook the, the way of God. In our case, it wasn't so much that we forsook the law, but we forsook Christ, the righteousness of Christ. And we'll see that. The Laodicean message was designed to arouse us from our sleep, to show us our backsliding. Remember, as we saw before, how the Laodicean message began early to us. I think it was 1852, right? It came to us. The Spirit of Prophecy says this is applied now to the church. It describes her condition. The goal of the Laodicean message was so that we would arouse and be awakened to what was our problems, to our backslidings, and then get rid of them. But we didn't give heed to this message, and we're becoming dry without Christ, without His love, and without His righteousness. So the coming of Christ was delayed in mercy. Let's see this text. It's amazing to see. This was written in 1868. Look what Elmite says. The long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy, because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish has been the reason for so long delay. Now, pay attention to the date. I said 1868, right? 1844 was the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Any time after 1844, Christ could come. If his people were ready, Christ could come. In 1868, how many years later? 24, right? 24 years later. Ellen White says that ha there has been so long delay. That should startle us. How many years have elapsed since then? More, more than 150 years. She says here, <clears throat> Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on 
unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel, in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed and Christ would come and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. What does it mean Christ would have come ere this? It means that ere means before. Christ would have come before this, before the time that she was writing. There are things that she mentioned here that were not done. Therefore, he couldn't come. But the fault was not with God. It was with us. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. She continues here. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. That should be another um, warning for us. She's saying it was not the will of God. People today charge God of delaying. Why is he not coming back? We're waiting for so long, we're just getting despaired. Why is he not coming back, right? That's what people say. But that's unreasonable. That's actually a false accusation. Because she's saying it was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people, Israel, should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with them. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. How is that? Isn't it shocking? She was writing this in, 1840, in 1883. 1883. We're in 2017. How sad. And what can be done? Right? Well... We sh first thing, we shouldn't charge God with the consequences of what we did. Look what she says. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. So the first thing is, Let's not blame God. It is us that did wrong. So let's blame ourselves. But there are more things we need to do. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. So we not only can delay it by our wrong course of action, but we can actually hasten His coming by giving the gospel to the world it will be earlier than it would have been had we not done it. 
So there's something we must do. She continues here. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess His name bearing fruit to His glory, how quickly the whole world would be, would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. But time progressed. The church was growing, but there was something missing. And it was not just something unimportant. It was the most important part was missing. If you remember the, this story, 2 Samuel 1, 17 through 27, David is placing a curse upon a hill, a mount. And the reason he's doing that is because Saul and his sons died in that hill in the battle with the Philistines. So David places a curse upon the hill and it gets dried up. The hill dries up. And God, through His prophet, is telling His church, is using this story to tell His church of our condition. Ellen White, in an 1890 uh, sermon that she gave, she said, in the context here, before I, I tell you, I read to you, she was talking about the message, receiving the message, receiving the righteousness of Christ, right? So, she says, And when you go from this place, oh, be so full of the message that it is like fire shut up in your bones, that you cannot hold your peace. It is true, men will say, you are too excited. You are making too much of this matter. And the matter was the righteousness of Christ. So people will say, oh, you're too excited about the righteousness of Christ. You're making too much of it. And she continues in describing what they will say to, to those who are excited about the righteousness of Christ. She says, And you do not think enough of the law. So you're too excited about Christ, you don't think of the law. Now you must think more of the law. Don't be all the time reaching for the righteousness of Christ, but build up the law. This is what people would be saying. But she continues saying, let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law until we get as dry as the hills of Gilboa without dew or rain. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. May God help us that our eyes may be anointed with Isaac, that we may see. And she said, I asked what had made this great change. She was seeing a company of people that were you know, weak and um, they were not ready for battle. But all of a sudden, she looks at them again and they're like, you know, in a posture of an army, all armored up with weapons, you know, in a, in a position ready for battle. And she asked the angel, what caused this change? An angel answered, It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. Do you see how the angel put these things together? This is the angel answering. He puts the latter rain and the loud cry together. In 1884, and now we must pay attention to the dates, okay? In 1884, she wrote, and this is found in Manuscript Releases, volume 20, page 357. She says, God is raising up a class to give the loud cry of the third angel's message. Of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Acts 20, verse 30. It is Satan's object now to get up, a, uh, to get up new theories to divert the mind from the true and genuine message for this time. The, um, he stirs up minds to give false interpretations of Scripture, a spurious loud cry, that the real message will not have its effect when it does come. 
This is one of the greatest evidences that the loud cry will soon be heard and the earth will be lightened with the glory of God. So in 1884, she was looking forward to the loud cry. She's saying it will soon be heard, so it's still forward. 1886, said my guide, there is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message, understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit, will lighten the earth with its glory. What? The law of God with the gospel of righteousness. The law and the gospel going hand in hand. Skipping that next sentence and going to the closing. The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with a power that will send the rays of the Son of Righteousness into all the highways and byways of life. And decisions will be, will be made for God as supreme governor. His law will be looked upon as the rule of his government. So the Son of Righteousness was going to shine to all the world. In 1892 now, how many years after 18, 1884? Remember I said 1884, she was looking forward to the loud cry. She said, it will soon be heard. Now, eight years later, 1892, the loud cry had already begun. Look what she says. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. So what was she saying? The loud cry has already begun. And the question is, when did it begin? If 1884, it was yet to begin. And if 1892, it had already begun. The question is, when did it begin? So when came the message? When did it start, in fact? Just, just look at this. 1884, the loud cry will soon be heard. 1892, the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. And the answer is, at Minneapolis in 1888. When the righteousness of Christ, which is to illuminate the whole earth with the glory of God, the character of God, it was presented to the people. The righteousness of Christ. And it was brought to our movement, to the church, through the instrumentality of two younger men, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. Look how Ellen White describes this. She says, the Lord, who? The Lord is not Jones and Wagner. She says, the Lord, in his great mercy, sent a most precious message to his people, through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is, manifest, is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Why did God send this message? Look what she describes here. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Did you understand this point? How amazing this is? She's saying, the Lord sent a most precious message, and this message was to exalt Christ, to bring him before the eyes of the people who had forgotten him. And then she says, in the last part here, this is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message. So the righteousness of Christ is the third angel's message. The preaching of the righteousness of Christ. But how can it not be? How can it not be the third angel's message? 
The third angel's message talk about the mark of the beast, but it doesn't stop there. It goes all the way down to verse 12 in chapter in Revelation 14. And verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We have studied a lot about, about the commandments of God, but we have not understood what the faith of Jesus is. The righteousness of God is shown through His law. If we exalt the law, if we exalt the righteousness of Christ, we're exalting the law of God. Because the law is His character. In, in text, is written. She comes to the point of saying that people were inquiring whether the third, whether justification by faith was the third angel's message. And she says that it is in verity. In verity. That means in truth. It is the third angel's message. Justification by faith. Why? Because it's not man's merit. Merit. It's not man's works. It is God's merit. His works apply to the helpless human being. With that, you will pass the judgment and be saved. Without Christ's righteousness, you won't. So, let us see some key points of what the message was. It was a message of justification by faith, the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. And you will see the pages here. The pages are from the 1888 Ellen G. White materials. The, uh, the title of the book is The Ellen G. White 1888 Materials. Okay? And it's a four-volume set put out by the White Estate. It's about 1,800 pages, I think. So you will see the numbers when it says page in this sequence here. It will just be referring to that, the 1888 materials. So it was a message of justification by faith. The righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. The tidings that, God, that Christ is our righteousness. The unmerited blessings that God has bestowed. His grace, His privilege, His opportunities. God's dealing with His people as a loving, forgiving Father deals with an ungrateful, wayward Son. The light shining forth from the Word of God has been clear and distinct. Justification by faith, Christ our righteousness. These great and glorious truths, the righteousness of Christ and the entire sacrifice made in behalf of men. So you will be able to continue to read this. Um, you can pause the presentation and, and see it and read for yourself. Um, it will be several uh, slides, actually four slides, with these texts. And you can read for yourself. So as we read, the Lord brought this message. It wasn't Jones and Wagner who, who decided to give a message. It was God giving through whoever He chooses. Can He speak through the donkeys? Or through the stones? Oh yeah. Then He can speak through anybody, even through, through you and I. But He chose Jones and Wagner to speak through right now, at that time. How was the acceptance of the message? She says... All this was an offense to God and must not, have taken any, must not have any place here at this meeting, Minneapolis. There were souls starving for food and they must be fed. I told them that which the Spirit of God had revealed to me as I was conducted to the rooms of those who came to the conference. I was made to hear the conversation, the sarcasm, the evil feelings expressed, the bearing false witness, the making light of the message God sent and the messenger who brought the message. So what were people doing in their rooms during the conference, Minneapolis? They were despising what God was sending. And not only the message, but the messengers. But what happens if you despise the messenger? Who are you despising? The Lord, right? She continues, I was told all this was wisdom from uh, wisdom that was from beneath, beneath in marked contrast to the wisdom that was from above, which has been specified by God through His apostles. I never labored in my life more directly under the controlling influences of the Spirit of God 
God gave me meat in due season for the people, but they refused it, for it did not come in just the way and manner they wanted it to come. Elders Jones and Wagner presented precious light to the people, but prejudice and unbelief, jealousy and evil surmising barred the door of their hearts that nothing from this source should find entrance to their hearts. Amazing. If you read their history, you will see that many years later, both Jones and Wagner were overthrown by Satan's, Satan's temptations. Just like Dr. Khaled, he was doing a tremendous work for the Lord. But because of all the struggles, he lost sight of Jesus and he became proud. So years later, Dr. Kellogg fell and his fall was great. Johnson Wagner also fell, although Wagner until the end of his life, he was still teaching the Sabbath school lesson, you know. But Jones was bitter because of all the bitterness that he encountered, right? Ellen White describes Jones and Kellogg uh, earlier. She, she says that they were suffering bitter opposition. And then years later, she said that they became bitter men. So they contemplated the opposition. They were not looking to Jesus and, and like Paul. Paul was suffering bitter opposition from every side, but he was bringing all his struggles to Christ and Christ helped him. But these forgot to do that. And they became, in what they, they became like what they contemplated. But people make the excuse that because they fell, Jones and Wagner fell, then the message was a mistake. But Ellen White warns us that this is a fatal delusion. If you fall, if you, if you believe that they didn't have a message from God because they fell, then you're into fatal delusion. What happens in a fatal accident? You die. What is a fatal delusion? It's something that you die. There's no, no salvation, no change, right? She says, some have made confession, yourself among the number. Others have made no confession, for they were too proud to do this, and they have not come to the light. They were moved at the meeting by another spirit, and they knew not that God had sent these young men, elders Jones and Wagner, to bear a special message to them. It is quite possible that elders Jones or Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. But if they should be, this would not prove that they had had no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. But should this happen? That means, should they fall? How many would take this position and enter into a fatal delusion because they are not under the control of the Spirit of God? How many would take what position? That they had no message from God. That they had no message from God. And that the work that they had done was all a mistake. And she continues. The message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. And woe be unto anyone who professes to believe the truth and yet does not reflect to others the God-given race. How can we know what they were saying? How can we read it? There was no transcript, official transcript, word for word of what happened at Minneapolis because they were not doing that. They started the very next year to do that word for word transcript. So if you want to read all about the conference of 1889, you can read, it's all there. But in 1888, there wasn't. Yet, there were people who took notes and they gave very good clues of what it was. There was one person who mentioned that he was both in the 1888 conference and in the 1893. In the 1893 conference, Jones preached 24 sermons and he entitled The Third Angel's Message. So just 1 through 24. If you read through those, 
your life will be changed. Just go to lnyaudio.org, scroll down to where it says Books of the Pioneers. Go to A.T. Jones and see the third angel's message, 1893. Ellen White says that she was instructed to use those discourses. God instructed her to use what Jones preached in 1893. So this man that was present in both conferences, 1888 and 1893, said that what Jones preached in 1893 was very similar to what he preached in 1888. My life was impacted in a way that I can't describe by those 1893 sermons. So I, I recommend it to you. Many people were prejudiced against the message. Satan caused this prejudice. But if we are not, just read through this screen here, if we are not prejudiced, then we can receive the message God has for us. In the next period, we will see what were the consequences of rejecting the message and what happened to to us as a people, what things had to happen in order for us to be able to continue.